Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. And this week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. Sometimes we have guests that are so popular that I get tons of questions. And this is one of those times where I thought, let's have him back on and talk about some of the questions that have emerged since then. And the timing is really good because Jonathan Haidt, of course, American social psychologist and author, he's written The Righteous Mind, The Coddling of the American Mind, now has just released his new book that is causing waves and waves and waves of conversation called The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. We talked about a lot of themes back in the fall uh, on this show, and I was surprised by how much response I received, not just, you know, through the normal channels, but in regular conversation with people who fit into multiple different categories, parents, college students, high school students themselves, and uh, church leaders about what do we do with this new rewired sort of world. So Jonathan Haidt, thanks for taking the time to come back on with us today. Oh, Russell, how exciting. Part two, I, I don't know if I've ever gotten a follow-up like this, uh, but you know, but there's so much, I mean, there's so much about religion and mental health that I'm learning these days. So I'm, I'm very pleased to come back and to explore some of these questions with you and your listeners. Well, I wonder, uh, you know, there, uh, often when one writes a book, there's this gap of time between when the book is written and when it actually is is out there in the world. And now it's out there in the world. Before we we talk about kind of what you've learned since then, why don't you recap for us what the, the basic argument that you're making in the book? Okay, so it starts as a kind of a detective story, mm-hmm. which is teen mental health was actually pretty stable in the 1990s and the, and the 2000s. From the early 90s through 2010, there's very little change. The suicide rate is going down. A number of indicators are getting slightly better. And then all of a sudden, like from out of nowhere, all the lines, all the graph lines for depression, anxiety, self-harm, suicide, all of them, they all start just going up, 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 beginning around 2012. Suicide starts a couple years earlier, but the, all the others start going up right around 2012, 2013. And we didn't really know this until around 2016 when Gene Twenge started writing about this. And that's when I got involved. I was writing a book with Greg Lukianoff called The Coddling of the American Mind about what was happening on college campuses. So in the later 2010s, we know something's going really, really wrong for Americans who were born after 1995. So we now, we now call them Gen Z. We thought they were millennials originally, but no, there's a difference. The millennials are actually doing pretty well psychologically, but if Americans born after 1995 are doing terribly, especially the girls, on mental health. The boys are doing badly in life, but the girls are doing badly on anxiety, depression, self-harm. So that's the mystery. Now, what caused it? And so I had a strong inkling because I was studying the effects of social media on society, on politics. I should say to your listeners, my primary work, I'm a social psychologist. I study morality and I've especially looked at the left-right culture war, at how left and right disagree with each other. And that's, I guess, part of what brought you and me together, Russell, was, you know, there's this large community of, of people, center-left, center-right, who actually are not crazy and want to get along and <laughs> like talking to each other. And so the whole book is really about how we have overprotected our children in the real world and underprotected them online. So the, the first part of the book lays out the stats on mental health, which I just told you about. The second part explores childhood. What is childhood? What do children need to do in childhood? Well, they need to practice the skills they'll need in adulthood. And they need to play, play, play. That's what all mammal, young mammals do. Play, play, play. That's how they wire up their brains. And in the 90s, in America, we began cracking down on that, saying, no, no, you can't go outside and play. It's too dangerous. Someone might abduct you, even though that essentially never happens in in this country. I mean, I shouldn't say never, ever, but it's not, it's like getting struck by lightning. It's not something that should govern your life. So uh, we cracked down on independent play. We oversupervised our kids. We blocked them from developing normal human strength resilience. 
But even during that time, their mental health didn't really decline. You know, we thought the millennials were maybe a little soft, maybe a little spoiled, everyone gets a trophy, but their mental health was actually okay. It's not until the second piece comes in, which is the very, very rapid move from flip phones to smartphones. And this matters for, for this reason. In 2010, so the iPhone comes out in 2007, but very few kids have one. It's expensive. They all have flip phones. In 2010, 2011, I think it's only 20, in 2011, yeah, only 20% of American kids had a smartphone. They're still on flip phones. Everyone's got a flip phone. And with a flip phone, you know, you have to press the seven key three times to make, you know, the letter S or whatever. You're not going to be typing out a long thing about your suffering. You're just like, you know, I'll see you at two o'clock. We'll meet at the corner, whatever. So in 2010, everyone has a flip phone. There's no front-facing camera. There's no high-speed internet. There's no unlimited data plan. And so they're not online all day long. Their phone is a tool that they use in order to connect to people and, and get together later. Fast forward just a couple of years, by 2015, now 70% of American teens have an iPhone or a smartphone. Most of them have a high-speed data plan, unlimited data. Their phones all have front-facing cameras. So now you have, especially the girls, are taking a lot of selfies. The girls especially have Instagram accounts. So they're posting those selfies up online. And what that means for girls is that much, and for, I think for a lot of them, most of their day, most of their conscious life is spent thinking about the photo that they put up, what people are saying about it, why someone commented on it or didn't comment on it. And so they get caught up. You know, girls can easily be pushed into thinking that what matters about them is their beauty, is that all that matters is their looks. There's even an amazing quote from Marcus Aurelius on this about r women in Rome. And, you know, we've tried for so long to, to help girls not grow up that way. Boy, is it back with a passion because of social media. So what I'm arguing in the book is that, in fact, the subtitle is how the great rewiring of childhood is causing an epidemic of mental illness. That's what we did between 2010 and 2015. We rewired childhood. Right away, our kids began getting anxious, depressed. Oh, and the pervasive sense of meaninglessness and loneliness. I mean, it's so sad. I mean, you look at these graphs and graphs can almost make you cry when you see what has happened to our young people since about 2012. Do you think that young people themselves recognize this or is this a situation where it's so much the atmosphere that one is in that it's difficult to see that things are abnormal? Yeah, yeah. Now, this is one of the most optimistic features of the landscape is that young people see it. There's, they're not in denial at all. Hmm. Previous, you know, previous generations. So there's always a moral panic about whatever technology the kids are using. Yeah. And so, you know, before my time, I grew up in the 70s, you know, in the 50s, I suppose there was a moral panic about comic books. But I don't mm -hmm. think you'd have found kids saying, oh, yeah, man, these comic books are so bad for us, but we just can't stop reading them. But man, mm -hmm. they are really destroying us. Like, no, they wouldn't have said that. And when you and I were growing up, probably, I don't know about your family, but we watched, too, you know, too much television. I'm not horrible amounts, but, you know, probably two or three hours a day of television. And our parents said, oh, it's going to rot your brain. And, and you know, we, we weren't like, yeah, you're right, mom, please, please help me not watch television. <laughs> right. You know, but television was actually pretty sociable. I'd watch it with my sisters. We'd argue about what to watch. You know, we'd get food. So it's actually pretty sociable compared to sitting alone in your room watching your own programs or your own feed. So what I'm getting at is Gen Z is very different from previous generations. When you ask them, do you think your generation is okay? 100% they say, no, we're in big trouble. Oh. We're anxious, depressed. No, we're in big trouble. You say, why do you think that is? And the leading answer in surveys is social media. They know it's a problem. And furthermore, I talk about this with my students at NYU. You know, we go through what it's doing to them. We go through how it, they've basically given up all their attention. You know, like eight, 10 hours a day of their attention is given over to this, this stuff. And they know it's bad for them. And I say, well, why, why don't you just quit? And they say, well, yeah. I can't quit because everyone else is on it. And yeah. then I ask them, what if, would you rather that TikTok was never invented? Would you prefer to live in a world where TikTok was never invented? And almost all of them say yes. If we could just make this thing disappear, we'd be better off. So I'm actually optimistic about the possibilities for change because we don't have to persuade young people. We just have yeah. to show them a way out. Well, I wonder if there's anything you've learned since writing the book and its release. I know you've been, been having tons of conversations and doing constant research. Is there anything you would, you would tuck into the book uh, as an appendix? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Yes. So I turned in the first draft of the book on August 21st of last year. I remember the date because I, I said to my wife, ah, okay, 
finally, my summer begins on August 21st. <laughs> and I had about a week off before, you know, the semester started and, and, I, and I had to go back to editing. But since August 21st, you know, I've done a bunch of minor revisions of the book, but I've continued to do a lot of research on my Substack, published with Zachary Rausch, my, my research partner, who created all the graphs, did the data analyses for the book. And so Zach has really been tracking down. So I, I asked Zach to take charge of two things. One is what's the story on boys? And mm. we really figured that out together. And so there's a whole chapter on boys. The cause is not social media per se. Actually, we'll get back to the boys. That's a whole other conversation. So the boys story is in the book and I'm, I'm very proud of that. I think we really got it. The other thing I asked Zach to do is figure out how international is this? Because when I hired him in 2020, I already knew or I was beginning to find like, well, we're not seeing evidence of this in Japan and Korea. I'm not, I can't show an increase in depression in Japan and Korea, you know, but, but in the UK, I can. Well, what's going on? And so Zach has tracked it down and he has a bunch of posts. If, if your listeners would go to afterbabble.com, that's the name of my Substack, they can find a bunch of posts by Zach showing that all the Anglo countries, it's the same. They all, you know, they all, the kids, especially the girls, right around 2012, 2013, started getting depressed and anxious in the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand. And he has another post on Scandinavia, same thing, Scandinavia. And then he just came out about two months ago with a post on the rest of Europe, because there is good data. There's not good data for most of the world about adolescent mental health, but in Europe, in the developed countries, there is. And what Zach found is that the rise in depression and anxiety is happening across Europe when you look at Europe as a whole, but when you break up Europe by region, what he found is that mental health is actually getting a little bit better in Eastern Europe. It's getting a little bit worse in Southern Europe, and it's getting a lot worse in Northern Europe. Hmm. Now, I don't know what that, if that calls out to you the way it calls out to me as a social scientist, what is that the dividing line of? Yeah, That's religion. That's Eastern Orthodox versus Catholic versus Protestant Europe. Those are the three religion blocks. And so I'm a huge fan of Emil Durkheim, the sociologist. He really opened my eyes. I mean, he you know, died 100 years ago, but his, his books opened my eyes to the fact that you have sociological realities, you have sociological facts, like the suicide rate is a, is a, is a fact about a, a society. And he said suicide is driven in, in Western cultures, a lot of it is driven by the sense of anomy or normlessness. And so, you know, in my, my sense is that Christian communities, especially more conservative Christian communities compared to progressive or progressive Christian communities, they live in tighter, more binding communities. There are more restrictions. Mm -hmm. The parents are going to be stricter. No, you can't read whatever you want. No, you can't listen to whatever music you want whenever you want. No, you can't go wherever you want whenever you want. And, you know, secular folk would look at, at, at religious Christians and religious Jews and think, oh, they're uptight, they're over-controlling, there's no freedom. And if you look at the data before 2012, you would see that religious kids, kids in religious families and religious adults are a little happier than non-religious adults. So all of this was known for a long time. But what happened after 2012, and here's the new discovery that I don't really have in the book because this really came in after we turned it in. The new discovery was that when you look at, when you look at who's getting, who, whose mental health collapsed after 2012, when you break up the data, not just by male, female, which we always do, when you also break it up by religious or not religious, there's a question on a big survey for high school seniors that's something like religion is important in my life strongly agree, mildly agree, you know, agree, disagree. When you take the kids who say agree or strongly agree and you plot out their mental health, it only gets a little, a little bit worse. Whereas the kids who are secular, they get a lot worse. I think we might've talked about this in our last conversation because I was just finding that out around then last fall. But to put it all together, what we find is that in the United States, being in a family in which religion is important seems to give you some protection as though you are anchored, you have roots. And so when the tidal wave, it was really like a tsunami, when the great rewiring swept across American society, the kids who were rooted, locked in, had a moral compass, had moral leaders, had restrictions, they were not washed out to sea. Whereas the secular kids, and the, also there's also a liberal conservative difference, the kids in secular households, they had a lot more freedom. And there are many good things that go with freedom, but it also brought vulnerability. And so it's those kids who really got washed out to sea. And so even though I think, I, I think we knew this right around when you and I last spoke, but we didn't have the international data. So to put it together, in America, religion's protective. And internationally, it's the countries that are getting more religious are protected. The countries that are getting less religious are the ones where you see the most damage. 
But why why would Japan and Korea be different? Those very are very secular societies yeah. as well. They're secular, but they are very collectivist. They are the textbook yeah. collectivist societies. A lot of my early research was in cultural psychology. My postdoc with Richard Schwader at the University of Chicago was in cultural psychology. I did some research in India. And at the time, in the 90s, when cultural psychology was really growing as a field, we were mostly focused on Japan and China. And then also, you know, basically, you know, East, East Asian Confucian societies. And so those are a puzzle in that they're, they don't have gods in the way that almost every other society does. They're sort of less religious in some ways. But boy, is that a binding respect culture, um, mm -hmm. a sense of where you fit in the society, do your duty, what's your role. So for all these reasons, the kids there, yeah, they're on their screens all the time. I mean, in Korea, you know, they have very little playtime. They are mm -hmm. on their screens all the time. But yet they are so bound into their families and their communities that I think they weren't washed away when they went on to social media. Also, I don't know the social media platforms they're on. They're, they're different than the ones that American kids are on. How much do you think this religious protection has to do with belief, the sense that you have people with a, a kind of meaning and ability to interpret the world with meaning, and how much of it has to do with belonging, that, that yeah. there's actually a community of people uh, around them? Yeah. So first I'll give you the stock answer that I gave from 2012 until about six months ago. Okay. Which is, okay, which is, and this is what I said in The Righteous Mind, which is, well, when you look at the data and you try to track out why are religious people happier, is it because they believe in an afterlife? So they think, oh, I'm gonna have eternal heaven. And the answer is no. Like the evidence, when you look at surveys, it's not religious belief that predicts happiness. It's belonging. It's being part of a community. It's do you go to church once a week, You know, do you go to religious worship once a week or more or do you go, you know, a couple of times a year? That's what the data showed about happiness, is that it's not about your beliefs. And here I was thrilled with that because it's like, wow, this is Emil Durkheim again. Like, And Durkheim, he has this book, but it's about the, the nature of religion. And, you know, Durkheim said that it's not really about the beliefs. It's about the, the creation of a congregation, the creation of a group. Okay, so that was my stock answer until about a year ago. Now, when you look at the data, and you'll see some of the readers will see some of the graphs in the book, some of the saddest questions are, Statements like, sometimes I feel my life has no purpose. Agree, disagree. Mm. And those numbers were kind of going down a little bit until 2012. And then, boom, they just go up like a hockey stick. And whenever you have a question about meaninglessness, despair, you see that skyrocketing, especially in the non-religious kids. And last night, I was in Austin. I was just on the Joe Rogan podcast. And I was uh, in a taxi coming back. And my driver, you know, I, I'd mentioned that I had a book. He said, what's the book on? And I said, well, it's actually about, you know, what's happened to your generation? Because he was 20, 23. What's happened to your generation? And, and he said, yeah, oh, wow. And I said, what do you think is happening? I didn't give him anything about who I am or what I'm, you know, what do you think is happening? Said, oh, yeah, you know, we've got really bad mental health. And, you know, yeah, we're messed up. We're in trouble, which is what they all say, Gen Z recognizes. And then I said, why do you think that is? And he said, well, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, for the boys especially for the boys, I think it's because, you know, they just, they just feel useless. They just feel that their lives don't matter. Mm. And I said, well, tell, tell me more. What do you mean, you, you know, useless, useful? Like, you used that word a few times when you just said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, I don't know. It's just like, you just feel like you don't mean anything to anyone. And so that, while that might point to the belonging thing, the belonging piece is key, but I think that the sense that you're not, you're not contributing something. You're not here for a purpose. It doesn't matter if you disappear. I think boys especially, you know, boys need to be active. They need to be doing, building, creating, competing, not just connecting. You know, connection is important for everyone, but for girls, it's more about connection. Uh, as Richard Reeves says, girls do things face to face. Boys do things shoulder to shoulder. And so there's just been a, like a draining out of a sense of meaning or purpose in life, which is especially harming boys. So I'm actually now much more open to the belief mattering. But you tell me, because I, I assume you have a view about this. What do you think it is that confers the protection? Well, obviously it's both. But I, I wonder with one of the things that coincided with almost, not quite, but almost perfectly with the data that you're showing here is a big change in American evangelicalism, especially with young people and especially with boys and young men, toward a much more doctrinally robust kind of evangelical Christianity. The resurgence. Like a, like a, 
Wow, like a great awoke, a great awakening, like a more religious fervor sort of thing in the boys. No, it's it oh. was it's actually a a resurgence of Calvinism that wow. that happened around the same uh, time period. Which, when asked why are so many people, young people, attending these big neo Calvinist, new Calvinist conferences and and events, the response that some people would give is they're looking for a big God. And so wow. with Calvinism, you've got historic roots, you've got a, a God who actually wow. is sovereign, and your life has purpose and meaning because every detail of your life is included in the plan of God. So you could have songs like emerging in the, say, the early 2000s. You could have songs like Cademan's Call, This Day's Been Crazy, But Everything's Happened on Schedule. Uh, you, you know, that sense of, of providence and of purpose. I wonder if there's not a connection between those two things. Tell me more about that. Do you think that this spread, like what year did this begin to spread? And do you think it spread because the kids are connecting via social media? Or do you think it came from adults and was introduced? I think it happened a little earlier than the, the social media explosion. So late, late 90s, uh, oh, okay. early 2000s. Okay. But I do think that there was a sense that the old model of Christianity wasn't working and, mm. and there, there really did need to be a bigger concept of God. So mm. in some ways, I think it probably lines up more with what you were talking about in Righteous Mind about awe mm. and about a, a drivenness toward awe. And this yeah. is typical in what I see, too. There are some of these, some of the trends we're talking about began before 2010, but they almost always accelerate after 2012. And so the decline of religiosity and especially church attendance, I attribute that in part to the fact that once young people and us too, all of us adults too, once we got our smartphones and we're more on social media, you know, you're talking three to eight hours a day of this stuff. It pushes out yeah. almost everything else. So I think people just don't have time. Or, or interest to, to go to church or synagogue anymore. Now, you would consider yourself an atheist or an agnostic, I think. Yes. Is, that, is that still the case? Does looking at data like this about the positive good of religion, do you see that just as one more aspect of human evolution? Mm -hmm. Or does it ever cause you to wonder, what if there's something actually mm -hmm. solid and true okay. underneath all this? Yeah. Okay, now that's a good question. Let me be thoughtful about my answer here. I guess what I have to say is, you know, as we talked about on our last time, when I was young, I was kind of like a typical, like, you know, science kid. I took religion very literally, and I thought religion is the statements in the Bible, and I didn't think those were true, so religion is false, and I believe in evolution, all that stuff. So that's the way I used to be. Yeah. And then as I began to study morality, I began to see that we, I believe we evolved to be religious. Religion is woven into human nature. We need we need gods, we need to hold something sacred. And you know, as I say in the new book, I strongly agree with the statement from Pascal that there's a God-shaped hole in every human heart. And if you don't fill that with something noble and elevating, it will get filled with garbage. So I've come to, as I said last time, I've come to really respect religion, my religious friends. I've lost all hostility that I used to have. But your question is not about my feelings towards it. Your question is, has this changed my thoughts about God and, and the universe? And I guess I would say, Coming to a much more positive view as a social scientist has not changed my own personal beliefs about the universe. But I would say that just getting older, you know, we're often very certain about our beliefs when we're younger. And I, you know, I would have said I was pretty certain, like even Richard Dawkins says in The God Delusion, you know, on mm -hmm. a scale of one to 10, if 10 is you're absolutely certain that there's no God, he, you know, even he says he's not a 10. You know, he would have to be below below that. And I would say, you know, the same way, I while I used to be very confident in my beliefs, now I see, I'm like, I, I saw a, um, a documentary in New York a couple months ago on the, the James Webb telescope and mm -hmm. what it's producing. And when there was a moment when they show that you take a tiny little patch of sky, tiny little patch, like much smaller than what the moon occupies, and then you zoom in on that. And what you see is millions of galaxies, like galaxies, mm. not just galaxies. And just the vastness is just, you know, you cannot fit it in your mind. And, that, and that's actually almost the definition of awe. And so I, I certainly do have experiences of awe about the universe, about nature. I do have spiritual feelings sometimes. And so while I don't interpret them directly as evidence of God, I do... I, they do sort of at least signal to me that 
I don't know what's really going on. Like there are, I'm a little creature with a small brain and I do not understand, you know, why we're here or, or, or how this all came to be. So, I, you know, I'm more open to it, but yeah. you know, it hasn't made me a, a believer. You know, C.S. Lewis in Surprised by Joy talked about that God-shaped hole that you mentioned from Pascal, but about this sense of longing that he called joy. Uh, not mm-hmm. not in the same way that we tend to use the word uh, the word joy, more of a, a longing sort of sense. And said so that led him to ask the question, if there's an appetite for something, an appetite for food is because there is food. <laughs> what okay. is this longing directed toward? Uh, yeah. And that's, that sort of led him down the path okay. of, of rethinking well, this stuff. Okay. Well, here, you know, and that's part of why Durkheim so appealed to me is that Durkheim also talked about that. He didn't say quite longing, but what he said was, there's a voice of authority. We feel it in our hearts. We feel yeah. that some things are wrong and some things are right. That morality speaks to us like a voice inside of us. And what is that voice? And he said, people have often interpreted that to be the voice of God. But Durkheim says, that's the voice of society. That's what it is to be a member of a society. So who knows? But I'm just saying that kind of argument that, there, yes, there is this longing and there is this moral voice in our hearts. And, you know, I lean towards an evolutionary explanation, although I admit that it's not, it's really not crystal clear. It's not like, we, you know, like the evolution of the hand or something. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, I don't really know what's going on. There are a lot of people who would like to move toward a spiritual but not religious kind of mentality that says we have this sense of spirituality. There's more than just the, the material, but it's not religious in the traditional sense. So it's not church, it's not religious books and so forth. It doesn't sound to me like you would think that that can actually counteract what we're, yeah. what we're facing now. Right, because what, what we see is that the protective effects of religion are not equal, are not even between left and right. Progressive mm. religious movements are not as binding. There are often movements of secular people to create something like religion. I think it was called Sunday something. There was a movement in the UK. Yeah. You know, of course the community is very important and you can have that without religion, but there's something about the tight binding and the circling around shared sacredness. That's very hard to do if everybody's bringing their own. You can't each have your own religion just like you can't each have your own language. Religion yeah. is about linking, religia, relinking to together and back to the past. So I think there are secular forms of community that are certainly helpful, but I think it would be hard to sort of just engineer, almost by intelligent design, a social system that confers the benefits of, of, a, of a successful religion. One of the questions that's come up quite a bit from, from listeners of our last conversation is along the lines of a friend of mine who said, look, I tried to implement some of the things that the anxious generation talks about. Uh, not having a smartphone until 16, for instance, those kinds well, of I things. Said, I said high school, but yeah. Okay. High school, okay. And and he said the problem was it actually caused the mental health situation to be mm-hmm. worse for yep. his child because right. everybody else has – so it, it, it isolated. It was pulling that child out of, out of exactly. that. So right. how does – how does a parent then, or a high schooler himself or herself, counteract that? So that's a perfect illustration of a collective action problem. Yeah. And that's what the last part of my book is about. And that's why we have, you know, we signed our kids over to a horrible way of growing up and we seem powerless to change, even though we know it and they know it. Because you can't solve it alone. If you try to solve it alone as a parent and you say, you're not having, getting a phone, then your kid really is isolated and that will be bad for their mental health. And that's why the theme of my book is we're stuck in four collective action traps and we have to get out of them collectively. So just to very quickly run down, the four are no smartphone until high school. Hard to do that if you're the only family, but what if half the families in your town do it? Then it's easy. Mm-hmm. Give them a flip phone. You don't have to make them phone. Let's just give them a flip phone. Number two, no social media till 16. And once again, if you're the only one who's not on Instagram and everyone else is, then it's hard. But what if half the kids are not on? Then it's much easier. The third is phone-free schools. And this is something that every religious school should do. Well, I don't mean tomorrow, but certainly for September. You know, if they don't Mm -hmm. already lock up the phones in the morning, it's not enough to say keep it in your pocket because the kids will use it. Yeah. Um, 
But going phone free is vital. It's easy. And I think religious schools are much better positioned to do that, to say to the parents, we need to do this. Can we all do this together for our kids' mental health? But that's what that's one of the things that also I received was from okay, Christian school administrators who are saying we would love to lock mm-hmm. up the phones. The problem's but not with the kids. The problem's it's with the, the parents. parents. Yes. OK. <laughs> right. But here. So. Right. So. But look what's happening. This is a common thing in politics. Most parents are upset about the phones. Most parents hate what's happening. Uh, yeah. Most parents either already would favor phone free schools for their kids, or they will once we start talking about it. Once my book, you know, the book is out, we're talking about this. But the I've heard this in secular schools. I went to my own, my old middle school, my old high school in Scarsdale, New York, and I heard the same thing. We'd love to ban them. We hate the phones. But yes, yeah, some parents freak out. Yes, some parents freak out. And those are the ones you hear from. And what I'm hoping, and again, everyone listening to this, if you have kids in a school where they don't lock up the phones in the morning, please contact, you know, it's like contact your representative. He needs to hear from you. Mm -hmm. The head of school needs to hear from you because if most parents are saying, please give our kids six hours a day free from this garbage, just, you know, school is the best way to give them six hours a day free from it. Then the schools will feel that they have the political support in the community to actually do what they know is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I would also add, even since our last call, new data has come in both from the American data, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is the nation's report card, and also PISA, the International Assessment of Educational Progress around the world. Both of them show a big COVID effect. That's the news. Like, oh, look how much academic performance declined during, from, from COVID lockdowns and, and mm-hmm. school closures. And that's true, it did. But what the graphs also show is that after decades of improvement from the 70s, 80s, 90s, decades of improvement, both PISA and the NAEP, they both collected data in 2012. That was the high point. Academic performance in America and around the world begins to decline after 2012. Then it accelerates after COVID, but the decline started after 2012. As soon as the kids get phones, they're texting They're texting during class. If you don't lock them up, they are texting during class. They're not paying attention to the teacher as much. They're not paying attention to each other as much. They're not talking to each other between classes. They're on their phones. So. This is a must. All schools must, K through 12, and certainly elementary, middle school, there's no argument about that. So that's the third norm is phone-free schools. And then the fourth, sorry to extend this, but the fourth is far more independence, free play, and responsibility in the real world. That's the harder one. But yeah. there too, there too, if you're the only one sending your kid out to, you know, to pick up something at the store or sending him out to play, you know, if there's no one else out there, it's scary, you know, it's lonely, people will call the police. So we have to get communities to say, you know, even though we were out by the time we were seven years old, you know, that was the norm during the crime wave when you and I were growing up by seven, by second grade. For me, it was by three. But okay, yeah. well, okay. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So right, it, it varied, but basically kids were out and they were caring for each other. And I'm not saying we should go back to six or seven as the age when we give kids independence, but I think eight is pretty darn good. Eight, third grade, kids are really competent. They can handle it. They can figure out subway systems. I mean, you know, you see the videos of the kids in Japan. At three or four, they go on these long errands. Like, kids can do it. They can do it. And it'd be so good for their mental health if we start letting them feel that they matter, that they can actually do things for the family. I was having lunch yesterday with a friend of mine uh, named Darren Whitehead, who's a pastor of Church of the City here in the Nashville area where I live. And he's written a book called uh, The Digital Fast, 40 Days to Detox Your Mind and Reclaim What Matters Most. And one of the things that, that they have done at their church is to try to encourage everybody, of course, there's no mandatory authority, but to encourage everybody to, to take 40 days Lent period, to be completely uh, away from their phones, to try to get at that collection action, collective action problem. And uh, I, as he said that, I said, you know what this reminds me of is dry January mm-hmm. and the yeah. effects that dry January tends to have. If, if you just have one month where everyone is saying, I'm not drinking this month because it's dry January and we're all doing this together. Mm-hmm. Some people go right back to the way they were, but there are other people who start to consider, wait, why, why have I become so dependent upon this that it, this was so hard? Is that, is that something that you would say could be the beginning of a collective action absolutely, type uh, response? Absolutely. So when we look at kids, a very common story I hear is about summer camp. Summer camps are amazing. Yeah. Most summer camps are phone free. 
never send your kid to a summer camp that isn't phone free. Why would you waste the time and money when you could actually give them exactly the kind of digital detox you're talking about? And I hear this story over and over again from parents and from the kids, from teenagers. They say, you know, the first two or three days at camp were hard being away from my phone. And I was worried about what other people were saying. And by the fourth or fifth day, I was over it. And wow, I could really talk with the other kids. I had an amazing time. I, you know, did arts and crafts. I did sports. I looked at the stars. And then they come home and the parents say, wow, my, my, my wonderful sweet child who I knew two years ago before her phone, she's back. And mm -hmm. the kids are so happy. And then they get back on their phones. And a couple of weeks later, they're anxious and withdrawn once again. So research on addiction shows that it takes, you know, three or four weeks minimum but really, 40 days sounds about right. Once you have hyperstimulated your dopamine neurons, which are the ones about reward and motivation to consume more and more and more, when you've hyperstimulated them for a long time, every you know hours and hours every day, they adapt. They literally change the the surface to have fewer dopamine receptors or less less responsive dopamine receptors. So your brain adapts so that when you don't have the video game or the social media or the alcohol or whatever it is then you're in a state of deficit. You, you have the opposite of reward. It actually feels really unpleasant and kind of painful. And that's what happens when you take your kid off of social media or video games. The first few days, they're probably going to be much worse off because their brain is craving it. And it takes a number of weeks. So yes, doing it together is crucial. It'll be very hard to do it if you're the only one. But if it's part of a community, it's part of your identity, it's a team thing, you, it, it helps you connect, then it can be done. So yeah, I would urge digital detox within communities. You know, in the Jewish community, we have Shabbat. At least Orthodox Jews really take it seriously. No cell phone, no, well, they have a kosher cell phone. They're, you know, they, they have a way around it, but it's clear, no smartphone, no internet. They don't, they don't do that. So they have a day every week. And I've heard from, I, I gave a talk to a, a group of, of Jewish day schools on Shabbat, on, you know, from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, there's no devices of any kind. And all the kids are playing with each other. It's really fun. Mm -hmm. It's a fun day. It's not a day of deprivation. One of the other questions that I've gotten quite a bit has to do with boys and girls. And, and you mentioned uh, Marcus Aurelius about uh, Roman society, First Timothy and First Peter, first century uh, Christian writing scriptures, speak to uh, congregations and direct toward the women don't be obsessed with your physical appearance, mm. braiding of hair. Direct toward the men, don't be quarrelsome. Mm. And it's it's not as though either of those, it's not as though Peter or Paul are saying, if you're a woman, be quarrelsome. It, it seems to be yeah. these are unique problems that are happening within, within the congregation. But there are some people who are saying, you know, I intuitively kind of know that this is affecting boys and girls differently, but it is really hard to say that right now. We're Even in your community, to, in my community, yeah. in sort of the more progressive intellectual, you're never supposed to say there's a difference between boys and girls, but you're finding it even in Christian communities? Even in Christian communities wow. because people have seen such a such an exaggeration of the differences, mm -hmm. uh, a really heavy handed mm -hmm. kind of misogyny, all kinds of yeah. okay. aberrant things. And so there are a lot of people who say, I, you know, if we start talking about distinctions between boys and girls, it easily can seem like it's going in that direction. And so people tend to just shut up about it and back up. Oh, th this is really helpful. Because I can. I think I can give you a simple idea that will make the problem much, much, you know, much, much less pressing. So what I've always told, I used to teach Psych 101 at the University of Virginia, and I had a whole lecture on sex differences. And I would start it off by saying, you know, we're all afraid to talk about it. We're all afraid that this will somehow, show, you know, people are, are we saying that women are inferior, that they can't run for president? Like, no. Mm -hmm. Look at the data on sex differences. If we focus on differences in ability, who is smarter, who you know, has, it has different skills, the differences are very small. There are some here and there. You know, men are a little better at like spatial rotations. Women are better at reading social. I mean, there's some small differences in ability, but they're, they're not that common. When we look at differences in desire, what do boys and girls like to do? What do they choose to do when you leave them alone? When there's no adult present, how do they play? Huge differences, huge. You find them across species too. Uh, chimpanzees, you see sex differences in play that are similar. Boys want more rough and tumble play. They wrestle. Girls don't wrestle. They just don't do that. So once you say, you know what? This is not about who's better. This is about the fact that, you know, prenatal hormones affect our brains. They change us, you know, from, from the female pattern to the male pattern. Boys and girls enjoy different things. There's a lot of overlap. 
there are a lot of boys who are effeminate or who, you know, Andrew Sullivan talks about this. You know, he didn't like to play rough sports. He liked to read poetry. And a, and a, a girl said to him, are you sure you're a boy? <laughs> you know, so, you know, we need to make room for girls who are masculine and boys who are feminine. But there is a real difference in what they enjoy. And every parent, just about every parent who has one of each can see it. So once we understand that, now we can say, not who's better, but who's more vulnerable to different appeals. And a platform that comes to you and says, hey, all your friends are here. All your friends are on this. They're all talking about this. Do you want to join? Mm -hmm. Now, every kid wants to be connected. But for girls, that's like, it's even more power. They have to. They're, they're just pulled more. Or a platform that says, hey, you want to have fake war with a bunch of strangers and you form mm -hmm. teams and you'll have, you can choose your weapons. You've got amazing virtual weapons. Like, that's just not going to appeal to girls as much as to boys. So the platforms know what they're doing. They know how to hook kids. And the social media platforms, and we know this from whistleblower Frances Haugen, you know, she brought out all this stuff. Facebook knows what it's doing about how to, how to appeal maximally to girls' insecurities. And the, and the video game companies are appealing to boys' desires. Not so much insecurities, but their desires. You have a phrase, uh, what is it? Coalitional competitiveness, is that, uh, or coalitional comp uh, competition about boys. How does one balance that aspect of, of connecting you talked about yeah. with that male sort of uh, desire for competition. Well, so one of the fundamentals of evolutionary psychology is that we evolved in a long period of time as hunter gatherers. And there was a division of labor because we have, you know, babies with gigantic heads and a female can't raise a baby alone. And so for all these reasons about early human evolution, women are more specialized for gathering, for finding plant-based products. And men are more specialized for hunting and for war. We are not just the descendants of those who found food. We're also the descendants of those who didn't get wiped out during war. Most people got wiped out during war. Most communities got wiped out, or if not by war, by starvation. Uh, but there was always competition between groups. And so boys are, in a sense, specialists in coalition building to compete with other coalitions. And you can call that sports, or you can call that war. But that's really fun for boys. And that's why when you just let kids do what they want, the girls are going to play in pairs. They're going to play in groups of two or three, whereas the boys are going to play in larger groups and they're going to spontaneously divide into teams to compete because it's really fun for boys to compete directly. Now, girls, of course, are competing in all kinds of ways, but it's not, as, it's not the direct team versus team that, that is fun for them as much. So that's the way I think about it. That, you know, and that's why the video games, it's the multiplayer team games. That's what's so exciting for the boys. One pastor said to me after our, our conversation, he said, I, I don't want to say this publicly, but I'm frustrated by our failure when it comes to porn. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, yes. Because it, it seems that what we have ended up with is not categories of people who are porn resistant and people who are porn enthusiastic, but instead we've ended up with categories of porn addicts and liars. <laughs> in his context. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, and so I look at that and I say, this is one aspect, really mm -hmm. clearly in a Christian sense, we're clearly morally defined. This is one aspect and we've completely failed on it. Yeah, How I can we agree. possibly try to deal with the, the even bigger issue uh, that, that we're dealing with with these mental health concerns? No, I think porn is, is, is has become unbelievably harmful to boys' development and to girls' sense of who they are or what sex is, or why they would ever want to have sex with a man after what they've seen online. So, you know, when older people, if you might think, well, porn is like, you know, playboy, and sure, you know, boys are interested, you know, straight boys are interested in seeing naked girls, what's the harm? And I don't think there's much harm from even a 12, 13-year-old boy seeing a photograph of a beautiful naked woman. I don't, I mean, maybe it's harmful, maybe it's not, I don't think it's harmful. But that's not what kids are getting these days. Once we got, in the early 2000s, once we get, you know, YouTube and streaming video, now you have Pornhub, or rather, lots of porn sites that are just like YouTube. There's RedTube, there were, I can't remember what they're all called, but they all uh, become very popular in the early 2000s. And now, but boys don't have a smartphone and it doesn't exist yet. Once they get their own, well, laptops, but then especially smartphones, now boys can watch porn every day, multiple times a day, and many of them do. I, it's something around 30 to 50%, I've seen different estimates, of boys visit porn sites every day. Of Ooh. girls, it's just like one or 2%. You know, they've all, everyone has seen porn. They all stumble across Pornhub, often in middle school. And Pornhub, you know, you've got, I mean, the sex portrayed there is, you know, very aggressive, it's degrading. 
So what kids are seeing is not a photo of a beautiful naked woman. They're seeing women being dominated and degraded. And for, for kids, you know, kids that have just come into sexuality, they're actually really disgusted by a lot of it, even if part of them is interested in kissing. And, and so, you know, for kids in middle school to you know, see graphic, like high resolution videos of anal sex when they haven't even kissed anyone, I think mm. is just a revolting state of affairs in our society. And the fact that there is no age gating, any child can just go onto any porn site and they're on, there's nothing stopping them. We have to change this. We absolutely have to change this. So yes, porn is interfering, I believe, and I talk, I review some research in the book, it's interfering with the sexual development of boys during the exact years of early adolescence when their hormones are kicking in, their desire is, 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 is rising. And this is when they need to learn, how do you flirt? How do you approach a girl? Girls are different from boys. I can't just say the things I want to say. You have to, it takes a long time to learn how to court a woman. And boys are not getting any practice. They don't know how to approach a girl. They don't need to for sexual satisfaction because they can find much sexier women uh, online. So, yeah, we've got to do something to, to reduce access. Worship okay. services. Uh, there are a lot of uh, people who are saying, I have an hour where I come in and worship with my community and I'm distracted by I'll, I'll get pings on my phone. I, I hear uh, that I'm, I'm getting distracted by all of that. But a lot of people, I mean, not, when I preach somewhere and I say, go in your Bibles to First Peter chapter two, most people pull up their phones. And, and go to their what, Bible you mean to app. Look at the Bible. Oh, yeah, oh, rather than their, okay. their physical Bible. Okay. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there was a a trend that happened in a lot of evangelical churches for a while of scent free services, which was to say we have some people who have allergies, right. and so we're going to have a service where you you don't have to go to this service, but if you do, oh, you're going to okay. say I'm not coming in wearing cologne and perfume or whatever. Oh, interesting. Okay. Do you think it could work? to say we're going to have specific worship services that are phone free. We're not mandating that everybody come in without phones, but for this service, would that do anything or yes. is that yes. just a cosmetic? No, that's a great, effect? that's a great idea because there's a couple of things going on here that are interesting psychologically. One is that we, many of us have desires for how we want to be in the long run and from a distance, but then when faced with temptation, we cave. So mm. I'm quitting drinking is easy. I've done it a thousand times. <laughs> and, you know, I want to eat less sugar, but I, you know, then the chocolate's in front of me and I eat it. And if you, and so I'll bet if the pastor talks about this with the congregation and says, how many of you feel that your phones, your digital stuff is, is distracting you in ways that you, you're not comfortable with? Almost all hands are going to go up. How many of you would like to really be present when you're worshiping versus distracted? All hands are going to go up. So, you know, this is a kind of a, a, a trap, like, you know, we want to be this way. We want to connect with each other and to God, but our phones keep calling us away. So what would you say about having worship services? And maybe it's just an optional one, or maybe it's all the services. What would you say um, if I asked you to literally turn your phone, put your phone on airplane mode or power it down or put it in a phone caddy at the front? You know, what would you say? So that would be an interesting question for a congregation to discuss, because it might be the case, as it is with my students, that when you put it that way, what if we all do it together? Hmm. I bet most of them are going to say, yes, let's do that. And then if they all do it, they're not going to feel, you know, because I'm sure there are times like, it's getting boring. I'm kind of bored by this. You know, let me just check, mm -hmm. you know, my texts. Like, I bet that must happen in church a lot, it's in the back row, you know, as in a, as in a classroom. The back row yeah. is where they're all yeah. online. So, yeah, I think they should try it. I think you should definitely try it. I bet, I bet there'd be support. Listeners, I've said this before. Righteous Mind is one of those books over the last 20 years that I would say this is one of the most important books of the 25-year period that we're in. Certainly one of the most influential in my own life. Anxious Generation is going to be the same. This is going to really change the conversation that we're having, and I hope will change the conversation within the church, not just in the culture. It's called The Anxious Generation, how the great rewiring of childhood is causing an epidemic of mental illness. Jonathan Haidt, it's always a, a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for being here. Oh, well, thanks so much, Russell. I, I think Christian Christian families and Christian schools really have a chance to lead on this and to develop ways of being that might even be a benefit to the rest of us. So thank you for having me on. A 
If you enjoy the Russell Moore Show, take a second to share this episode with a friend or leave a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host is Russell Moore. Produced by Ashley Hales. Associate producers are Abby Perry and Mackenzie Hill. Director of Operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Audio engineering provided by Dan Phelps. Video producer is Abby Egan. And the theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton. Thank you.